want to do, uh, welcome all of you to the Lake Wales Art Center. My name is Tommy Frank, I'm the Executive Director here, and we're really glad to host this event, the capitulation of, that's an essay keyword, the uh, <laughs> entire time that we've been investing in our town and, and getting together and, and swapping notes. Uh, how many of you guys remember this when it was an old church? It's kind of hard to miss, but it still is. And then we changed it and turned it into an art center. I think that the things that we're looking at in Lake Wales right now, we know it how it was. We know that it needs to change to be something else. We're happy to be here at the Art Center where we can talk about those types of changes with all of us together. So we're happy to have Edgar Dover and his team. And uh, I'm going to hand the baton off to him. No, don't go away, Tommy. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Victor Dover, uh, town planner. I think we ought to all uh, join in thanking Tommy Frank and the Lake Wales Arts Council for hosting us here tonight in their Cathedral of the Arts. Thank you, Tommy. <laughs> now, some of y'all know that uh, way back in 1949, Clarence Thibodeau painted this beautiful painting called Box Dream. You know, Bach's admonition to all of us was that we should make the world a bit better and a bit more beautiful for having lived in it. Uh, and that was captured in the beautiful painting. And we've attempted to infuse everything in these last few weeks, Tommy, with this, uh, with these ideas. And so we took the aspirations for Lake Wales Envisioned, a long range plan for the future that were adopted by your city commission. And we put them on this poster and Tommy, uh, I have one for you uh, from, the, from the design team to thank you for having us here tonight. There you go. All right. <laughs> now you gotta figure out where to hang it. <laughs> We're better than a gallery to figure out where, how to hang things. We, oh, by the way, for those who, who love that painting as much as, as I do, there's, uh, there are smaller versions of su su souvenir and placemat sized birds. <laughs> birdcage lining size uh, versions of that, and you're welcome to take one home with you tonight. Thank you, Tom. Tonight we get to put our pencils down and look up on the screen, and show you things that we've been working on over the last six or seven days, and ask you the most important question. Is this what you meant? What have we missed? Uh, what do you like the most? What are you most concerned about? In particular, with the months that remain in the process of developing Lake Wales Envisioned, what do you think we should go get more information about and improve and fill in the blanks with? So we are gonna start um, with a recap of the way things uh, have unfolded over the last several days. Then we're gonna show you some what if pictures and maps and things. All of it is wet ink, very much draft work some of it just completed as I was coming up the stairs and up in the choir loft, they were still fixing things. Thank you, Elise and, and Eric and Kenneth for doing that. Uh, our firm, Dover Colon Partners, has been asked to help lead this process, but, we're, uh, but I have to say, I'm surrounded by an amazing and talented team, and I couldn't be more proud of what they did over the last few days. Uh, that includes our transportation experts from Kittleson, Wade Walker. Wade, wait, raise your hand so they know how to track you down because everybody wants to talk about traffic. Jay Exum, who couldn't be with us here tonight, but we'll hear, you'll hear about during the presentation. Dr. Exum is an ecologist and the green conscience for this work. Um, and George Kramer and his team from Inspire Placemaking, who are the keepers of a really important uh, body of institutional memory about planning. They are also the authors of your late, the latest versions of your comprehensive plans, your parks and recreation plan, and many other crucial documents that the city is, uh, uses. So we've all been working together on this. You're gonna see that some of it is neatly integrated and makes a lot of sense, and there are no internal contradictions. And you are also gonna see that some of it feels more like the loose, disassembled skeleton of ideas that we still need to assemble. Um, my, uh, my wife, Madi, uh, is uh, an artist and an architect, and, and she started drawing this week and challenging us to see how we could imagine what the Lake Wales Way is for growth and change and preservation. 
if we get together, get, to, get together on what it is, what is the Lake Wales way to grow and change over time, uh, that will be the signal accomplishment of Lake Wales envisioned. For those who are new to the subject, let me quickly flash a couple of maps that are important. In the middle of this map, the kind of orange color is uh, the, uh, the existing footprint of the city. Uh, so the city limits, uh, we'll drill in on more detailed maps in a bit of what's developed and still to be developed within the city limits. There are changes all the time, of course, and some have just very recently occurred, so every last one of those may not be reflected. But you can see the center piece of this darker color, that's the city limits. The egg yolk color around it, that's the utility service area, which the, in which the city uh, can, if it chooses, uh, annex property and provide water and sewer services and other municipal services to land development within those areas. And the challenge for Lake Wales Envision is to go beyond the small area shown here in red that we studied together in uh, the important downtown and northwest neighborhood plan called Lake Wales Connected. And I joked the other night that Lake Wales Connected with a relatively small amount of geographic territory uh, was not as hard as what we're taking on now together. Uh, it also is fairly non-controversial because revitalizing your historic downtown, who could argue with that? And uh, filling in the lost space and reviving neighborhoods and uh, bringing the Northwest neighborhood up to the, the standard that has become accustomed in other neighborhoods and and doing, doing so in a way that's respectful and equitable. Those are easy to cheer for, non-controversial ideas. But we're gonna, when we get out into this, the edges of the peach color and into the, into the yellow and say, what should be out of the city? And how should that be done? It's gonna get a lot harder. That's the nature of this work. So to set the stage for that, uh, we've been going through a process of designing in public. Uh, designing in the sunshine, you would say. That is far from over, but I want Amy to come up and give you a recap on how that has unfolded so far. It, this is Amy Groves. She's the project director for this work on behalf of our firms. Uh, she's also principal in Dover Coal. Uh, welcome Amy Groves, who put all this together. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. I'm sure we've had a really great week this week, but I'm going to start back at the beginning. So many of you joined us on March 20th. We had our, our kickoff and best practices symposium. It was a really great afternoon. We had over 100 people come out. Uh, we had three different sessions. Uh, we talked about community design, uh, how community development brings value, and also the Big Green Network. Uh, we had a Many people come, I mentioned, and you know, we had these exhibits uh, outside of, of the symposium where folks could start to write and explain their ideas, what they would like to see in the future. Uh, we also asked a question that evening at the kickoff. We asked, which of the following is most important to you? And we know that all these things are important, but uh, it was interesting to us to see the top two answers uh, from those who were there that night were protecting the natural environment and economic development. And so those are both obviously very important things and some folks may think that those are opposed to each other, but it's very interesting to us that those are both you know, the highest priorities uh, here in Lake Wales. So of course, other things you see high on the list, parks and open space, uh, neighborhood design, uh, infill and revitalization. So we know all of these things are important, but it really helps set the stage that night. Uh, I mentioned we had folks writing on posters uh, in the room and to give you a sense of some of the things that they were writing, we asked what were their favorite places uh, in Lake Wales and you can see they mentioned Crystal Lake Park, the Bike Trail, Historical Society, Bach Tower, you know, lots of really amazing things here in Lake Wales uh, that they could choose from. Uh, they asked what opportunities Lake Wales should pursue in the next 10, 25, and 50 years. Uh, things like uh, walking and biking opportunities, appealing to multi-generational families, uh, creating green spaces and preserving view sheds, all things that were on, on the mind. 
Uh, we asked about the top challenges for lake whales that you should prepare for, things that people were worried about, uh, how will growth happen, loss of habitat and diversity, traffic issues, um, industrial de development and economic development. So those are economic development is an opportunity and potentially a challenge uh, to be addressed in the, the vision. So we asked people what were um, some places that uh, you visited that we thought could be a precedent potentially for new development here. We got a whole range of uh, answers, uh, but here's just a sampling. Uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where there's a historic active downtown uh, surrounded by multi-purpose communities. Uh, there's just in general communities that have uh, guidelines for development. Uh, mentions of Winter Garden, Perry, New York. So again, lots of things for our team to think about um, from that session. On uh, March 29th, we had a webinar with Joe Minicosi. Joe's a leading economist and he looks at uh, how development brings value. Uh, and so if any of you are interested, you should go to our website, lakewhalesandvision.com under the resources tab and you can watch that is it just over an hour. It's a really interesting uh, presentation from Joe. So you know, to prepare for the Charette Week, our team created a variety of maps. This map, uh, that study area that Victor was showing, showing the city boundary and the surrounding uh, utility service area that we're focused on. We also studied uh, the natural features, looking at where there's wetlands and flood zones, uh, looking at where there's large landowners who hold, you know, large contiguous parcels of land, uh, looking at the rolling topography, it's obviously a signature of, of Lake Wales. So, you know, all of these things are things that we're thinking about in those maps we had around the studio. So that led us up to this week uh, and the Charette Week. You know, we had a variety of events, I think, you know, really great attendance and, and great conversations at, at all of them. Uh, starting last Friday at the opening reception in the tent on Stewart Avenue, Y'all made me remember that we had a, a video camera and we were recording people. And so I'm just gonna let you hear a sampling of what some of the folks that we asked, you know, what was on their mind that night. One that values history, preserve its historic buildings and green spaces. I think they need more patrol here on the weekends and at night. Infill development, downtown, an active revitalized downtown that they've already got in place, high quality housing, yeah, without urban support. Good jobs that um, pays them enough to stay in the community and to live, work, and play here. Kind of keep the Olmstead vision alive for Lake Wales and have the tax base they can afford to pay for it. Having a walkable community, restaurants to go to, bars to pop into and have a drink. A lot of green spaces and uh, it's uh, calming. It's, you know, people need to calm down. So, uh, and accommodating the wildlife too, because you know, we have to share this planet with other animals that occupy it. Is when all of these homes start getting built in Lake Wells, that they're zero emission homes. Be a leader, show the world that a community can lead and solve the global warming crisis. So again, you all may remember we had these little blue cards that night and we asked people uh, what was one word that they would use to describe Lake Wales now and in the future. So we took all those cards and we typed them in and, and the way this works is the more often a word was said, the larger it gets. So you can see um, you know, some of the words that you know, many people said that got big here, quaint, potential, charming, growing, community, all things to describe Lake Wales today. Uh, and then we asked in, in your vision, what would be one word to describe the future? So again, interesting to see charming, community again, quaint again, <laughs> welcoming, vibrant, thi thriving, uh, home, beautiful. So again, all things, this is an interesting icebreaker exercise for us to you know, start to hear what's on folks' minds uh, and uh, you know, interesting to, to read. So the next morning we had uh, what we call the hands-on design session. We rolled out base maps and we went through some visioning exercises uh, with the folks who came out, uh, you know, asked them questions about how they would like to see the city grow, you know, what they would like to see in the future. Similarly, we got our video camera out and so I'll, I'll let you hear a little bit uh, from the words of folks who were there. The entire city is truly connected, just like the connected plan, that we all look the same and we're connected to one another and just not the city. Keep that small town uh, atmosphere. To have lots of parks 
and to have a cool Main Street. We've become an example that the entire country would look to um, in terms of planning ahead, setting aside conservation areas, planning compact walkable neighborhoods, and just um, incorporating beauty into everything that we do. I'd love to see more connected communities with bike trails and uh, walking trails between each of the developments that end up coming here. Provide a place for older people to retire, to have communities that are planned so that they are close to open spaces and also facilities and have mixed use in many different places. A more dense, historically preserved area in our historic core and preserving those exterior peripheral parts of the city for agriculture, conservation, uh, so just keeping everything um, condensed in our, in our center of our city. We create a roadmap for the city of Lake Wells, one that everybody has a voice in, that everybody can sit around the table, talk together, have great dialogue with one another, and then come up with a conclusion that's mutually agreed upon. I think Maggie Mullerot deserves an extra round of applause. For 11 years old, she was pretty amazing. <laughs> Uh, so we did an interesting exercise that morning and those who, who were there may remember with uh, these sticker dots. And so what we did was we looked at what the county's growth projections were through the year 2050 uh, and uh, assumed that Lake Wales would have some percentage of that growth. So we said every sticker dot was 200 people or 100 units. And so if Lake Wales had up to 5% of the county's growth anticipated in that time, that would mean uh, 33,000 more people by the year 2050. And we said, okay, if these people are coming, where, where, should, where should they live? And so you could put your sticker dots on top of new neighborhoods. You could put your sticker dots on top of existing neighborhoods, you know, infill in the downtown, uh, you know, change other areas inside the city limits or anywhere in the utility service area. So you weren't limited on where you could put them. The rules were that you had to use all the dots to accommodate the, the projected population, but you're allowed to stack them. So for example, one dot would be two and a half units per acre, but if you put down four dots on top of each other, that would be 10 units per acre, which would roughly be townhomes uh, as opposed to single family homes. So it, was, it led to a lot of interesting conversations uh, at the tables. We also then did a street design exercise where we gave people playing pieces and we asked them to design the ideal street and asked them you know, what kinds of things they would like to have, sidewalks or bike facilities, um, street trees. Uh, we also asked them to design a neighborhood. We gave them playing pieces for blocks and streets and uh, public spaces and, and asked you know, what, what were the ideal components that would make up uh, their ideal neighborhood. So at the end of each of those uh, you know, sessions, we, we had someone from each table get up and, and present uh, their table's ideas. Uh, and so we, we did have a, a, big, a good range of you know, adults and we had one uh, table of kids that, that helped out. Uh, here's some of the results from those sticker dots. So you can see the, the, that's an example of four tables on the right. You can see some, some patterns start to emerge of you know, the, where, where folks were putting their stickers and actually this next one, we, uh, we start, we overlaid all seven tables on top of each other. So the darker a dot means, that means that more tables um, located their stickers in those places. So you can see downtown, the area south of downtown, south of Lake Wales, uh, you know, and along 27 were some of the areas where um, many tables located their dots. Uh, we also took notes during the presentations. Um, and so here's just a sampling of some of what some people were saying. Um, you know, the open space connections, um, having Olmstead geometry for blocks and streets, uh, infill in the existing developed areas, maintaining scenic view sheds. Uh, there was an idea about a blue way, um, uh, having Lake Wales being the, the jewel and the, sa the sapphire necklace, the connecting to Winter Haven. Uh, the idea that streets, um, some are over wide and you can slow them down with street trees and have sidewalks and parking. Um, ideas about connecting developments with trails and sidewalks and having neighborhoods that are, you know, have a mix of uses. So things where people could walk to, to do some of, some of their daily needs. Um, and if there's a higher density, yes, but having higher standards to go along with that. So, you know, people were willing to put the dots down, but it led to a lot of conversation of that. You know, it was also important, you know, what those dots looked like, you know, what new neighborhoods looked like uh, was important. 
So on Sunday, our team uh, got a tour of the Ty Tiger Creek Nature Preserve. And so we did have a group of about 20 uh, that went out uh, for about a three mile hike and, and learned a lot. Uh, and uh, when we hear about the Green Network, we'll hear a bit more about uh, what was learned that day. Uh, Monday night, we did a uh, another hands-on session by Zoom. So, you know, similar to the, the Saturday morning session, but uh, over Google Maps and, and had some, uh, some small conversations there as well. That night, we showed these images, um, which are interesting. This is, um, so scale comparisons. This is the existing Lake Wales Utility Service Area, the maps we've been looking at. Now we're going to take that yellow boundary and superimpose it on other known areas just so you can get a sense of how vast that area is. This is the city of Jacksonville. Um, this map here is, is Orlando. So again, just sliding that boundary up, you can see um, you know, how much area that covers. And just for fun, we put it over top of New York City. <laughs> it does, you know, it just, it's a very large area when you think about you know, how much land that actually covers. So then during the week, our team set up a studio space. We were over the weekend, um, we were uh, in the former Giorgio's restaurant downtown. And then uh, during the week, we were in the Lake Wales Women's Club. Uh, and we had you know, folks coming in uh, for different meetings on topics. We talked about uh, housing and parks and transportation and environment. Uh, and we had people come in and look over our shoulder and see, get a sneak preview of some of the things we're gonna show tonight. So with that, I'm gonna just do a couple of um, polling questions. So if you'd like to participate uh, with your phones, uh, I'll give you the instructions on how you can do that. And we're gonna do a couple of questions now, and then we'll ask some questions at the end of the presentation about uh, some of the drawings you've seen. So the, the way to get started is to open your text messaging, uh, and you text the number 22333, uh, and you send the, the message Dover Coal 516. So I'm gonna give everyone a minute just to get out their phones and, and get registered. Again, it's sending the message, you send it to 22333 and the, the message is Dover Coal 516. And if you do that successfully, you'll get a confirmation message back that looks like this. You, I'll go, go back one time here. So again, it's, it's 22333 to the message Dover Coal 516. So we'll go, on, we'll go to the first question. The first question is uh, hopefully easy. Uh, we're curious for those in the room tonight, uh, what's your primary interest in the study area? So if you text the letter A, that's for I live in the study area. You can text B for I work or own a business in the study area. Uh, C is I don't live, work, or own a business, but you visit frequently. And you text the letter D for other. Now it should be said, our study area is the entirety of that big yellow map, the utility service area and Lake Wales within it. Um, so if you do live or work in the area, um, for how long? So A is less than two years, B is uh, two to five years, C is six to 10 years, D, longer than 10 years, and E is if you do not live, work, or own a business in the study area. This is fun, right? <laughs> I want to thank Elise Dallas, who took a lot of time to build this poll. Uh, Elise is up in the choir loft making sure the computer's working for all of us. So thank you, Elise. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on to the last question for this section, and then I mentioned we're going to uh, ask some more at the end. So um, we're curious how many folks in the room came out to the different charrette events this week. So remember, there was the Friday night opening reception, the Saturday hands-on session, the, the Tiger Creek walking tour, the plant, events at the planning studio. So if you can answer A for online, online there's both the, the online Monday night event, <coughs> that's right. So. A is for none, this is your first event. B is if you came to one other thing. C is if you came to two or three other events. And D is uh, four or more. All right. The purpose of having so many events is so that people who miss one don't get behind. They can catch up, they can get filled in on the next one. But also, so we keep changing the format. Small groups, big groups, online. 
uh, talking, drawing, because all of us are different. Um, one thing I will say is that it is no small feat to both manage the content of a big project as complex as this one and organize the whole team and all these events. And Amy Groves, it did all that. Thank you, Amy, very much. Now, let's take a look at some of what we have so far. Uh, given that recap of the process, of course, you know, this is all fresh work and all subject to change. In fact, we might go home and get a good night's sleep and think, realize we did some of it wrong and fix it. And the process is meant to be that way. We're bringing it out before it's ready and showing what we have so far. Uh, so would everyone please repeat after me, draft. Draft. <laughs> okay. That means it's all subject to change. I should say also that, um, well, first, no human being on earth has ever seen this whole presentation from, from beginning to end because they were still making changes until the last minute. Uh, so you're not being held to any of it. But remember, the property owners, the business people, the leading advocates and citizen leaders, your elected officials, your city staff, none of them have signed off on any of this. What we have tonight is just starter work that we're going to work on perfecting. We're going to iron out the rough spots and fix over the coming weeks and months. In fact, this little stop in the road is to help us start that process. So uh, therefore, don't run out of the room with your hair on fire and, uh, and tackle one of your elected officials and tell them that this is all wrong because it's our fault, not theirs. Okay. Um, first, I want the first word you see in this discussion about the future to be this word. You hear, you hear me, Skip Offered? The first word I'm saying is the word jobs. Because if we have population growth, but we don't think wisely about way, you know, ways to employ that growing population and ways for the people who have grown up here to keep participating in its, in its economy and to rise through, up, upward mobility uh, to better wages and better lives and better wealth creation for their households and families and more to leave to their heirs. If we miss that, we blew it. So it, that, there's a lot to this. There, we have to think about things like uh, becoming more technologized, about evolving from a place where a great many people were employed in agriculture to a time when, unless the, the citrus challenge is resolved, people will have to be in other kinds of jobs, like health sciences or technology. In order for that to happen, we need a deep commitment to training and education and fostering of new and small business, not just the big businesses. We also need to recruit the larger employers that might be interested in a place like this for its virtues, not because they could just go anywhere and this one was cheaper, but because this is the kind of place where their business belongs because they fit with the Lake Wales way. Um, I will say uh, remote workers, an interesting conversation over and over this week. We heard concentrate on the new technology for work because now that a lot of people are working from home or go into the office only on occasion, that might mean that they could work pretty much from anywhere. And uh, if I'm right about that, they can do things like uh, go to a, uh, an office in Orlando or Tampa only once every couple of weeks or once a week instead of every day. Why is that important? Because if we concentrated on commuters who are working far away as that future population to, to promote and attract, then we're talking about folks uh, who are condemned to spend enormous amounts of their lives behind the wheel at the beginning and the end of each workday. You can do the math, but if you, if you spend an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening or uh, going to and from work, and obviously anyone working as far away as Orlando or Tampa is in the I-4 of the modern era is farther than that. Um, over the course of 18 years of raising a child, that's a couple of years worth of prime time. Not middle of the night time when you're all asleep, not middle of the day time when they're at school and you're at work, 
but the actual time when you would spend with your children. So concentrating on remote workers is a big, is a big potential. Uh, this is a different approach from concentrating on bedroom community customers. We also have a lot of people here who have uh, supported their families or themselves picking fruit or working in the citrus industry. And the, there's gonna need to be other options for those people. Someone pointed out that when the packing house on Hunt Brothers Road closed, 70 jobs were lost the day that the packing house closed. So I'm starting with jobs because I want us to understand that more and better jobs is connected to more and better wages. And more and better wages means the ability to bring one's family up into the middle class and beyond. And it means you, they have the ability to choose that better neighborhood. So uh, really, this is indispensable. Now the, um, the rest of this is not gonna surprise you. The second big word is green. Greenness. Um, we heard a lot of it. You heard some of it in those short video testimonials that the others were saying. And um, the, the interest in, a green, in the big green network, as Amy called it a couple of times. Um, well, the Lake Wales Way has always included open space in a thoughtful way. The founders of the town, uh, when they laid it out, they set aside that enormous, generous amount of park space around Lake Wales and at Crystal Lake Park, just for example. And they also conceived your public spaces with a kind of welcome quality. So even a street, an ordinary, as ordinary a thing as a street, like Park Avenue is designed to be a public space where you'd be happy to greet a neighbor or a place where people would wanna be. So greenness is, um, is a component here. There's a bigger picture to that, which is that you know, your beauty is your economy, as we kind of heard Frederick Lalmstead Jr. admonish us that economic development should be done um, in such a way that we, the first order of business was to maximize the, uh, the power of scenery in conjunction with its economic development. So just like those, that early poll slide where people said economic development and uh, protecting the natural environment, and Amy said that it doesn't have to be a trade-off. That's what Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. was telling us. So there are a lot of components to the green story. Green, green building and energy conservation at the level of the building, green tree-lined streets, green ways and trails, large-scale conservation area, parks, um, and of course, build, if you want that to occur, you have to think about how to pay for it. If the key word under jobs was sites, because there have to be sites, locate that is, land, where those, kind, those jobs can grow in, the key word under green is acquire. Because privately held property that might be near your house or visible from your favorite spot is not your personal private nature preserve, it's somebody's property. And they have property rights, and they may or may not agree with you that it should remain as part of a big green network. Communities that are committed to this green idea put their money where their mouth is. They also uh, advocate for themselves in the search for philanthropy, grants, their share of conservation funding. Most of y'all know that in November, uh, the voters in Polk County uh, uh, passed uh, by a significant margin a referendum to expand conservation land acquisition funding. You can use that kind of money uh, and, and related state programs and so on to buy land, that is one way, uh, to protect it and to keep it green forever. You can also use it to acquire conservation easements, which means somebody might continue to farm it or use it another way, but it won't sprout one last crop of uh, identical houses. So, word number two, green. Number three, <laughs> this one includes a lot of things. Neighborhoods. This one may be the more explosive of the three words. Uh, because the, in order to try and put on paper what you are describing to us when you d 
describe what you love about the older historic neighborhoods in the Lake Wales you have, the ways those, by their DNA, by their form, embody the Lake Wales way. And if you want that, those same features and qualities to exist in new development, uh, that's a big change. This is gonna be a little bit like turning an aircraft carrier. Doesn't happen all at once, because as you all know, the sprawl building machine is set up to build the opposite of that. So default settings in land development is not to build real neighborhoods, but to build subdivisions and office parks and shopping centers and apartment complexes. So there are many pieces to this idea. The complete streets, which you'll hear more about from, from Wade in a minute, are part of the neighborhood idea. The biggest thing about neighborhoods is um, really getting the rules right because communities get the planning that they deserve by how willing they are to ascribe, to ascribe high standards. One of my comments just off the cuff the other day to a couple of you was, the wrong time to decide to have high standards is after all the land has been built on according to, the, to low standards. Does that make sense? The right time is now, but explosive, this is not gonna be easy. There's a lot to fix and there's a lot of inertia in the sprawl building machine. So zoning's at the center of this, of this issue. Well, let's put it all together. If we try to take everything we've learned in this, in this week and put it on the maps, we're gonna find there are, it's possible to describe each sector of land in one of four categories. The first one we call it priority conservation areas. That really means land that for uh, defensible, scientific, data-driven reasons really need to remain in green. Some of that is tightly regulated, some of it is not. Number two, priority infill areas. This is the other end of the spectrum, like downtown, uh, the Northwest neighborhood, like the, uh, neighbor the neighborhoods around Polk Avenue, um, and logically, the uh, partially built suburban areas. Let's say along 27 at Eagle Ridge Mall and its environs or around along 60 near the hospital and Orange Grove Shopping Center and its environs. These are good locations to prioritize for infill. So while on the outskirts you might identify priority conservation areas, in the middle you need to similarly identify priority infill areas and we can map those. Third, your population growth as projected, if it turns out to be true according to projections, um, will require additional development. The footprint of the city, even after you take advantage of those infill opportunities and so on, is likely to grow. And that means taking some greenfield sites. Maybe it's a former citrus grove that now needs to become a new neighborhood. Um, and you can look on the map and decide, okay, these are good spots to do it. We have to do it on the community's terms and do it at high quality, but that would be a good growth area. On the other hand, there are other places that are farther out, and they may not be quite as, uh, as deep in the lowlands and wetlands that are protected under federal law, or uh, they may not be the location of an endangered species. But they're nevertheless in uh, places where it's not your intention to grow the city ever outward across the horizon. And so growth nevertheless will occur in those areas, but you can strictly control or to whatever extent limit growth in those areas. You are not gonna be successful at limiting growth unless you're willing to make investments because for example, there are a base level of property rights that all of the people out in the unincorporated county have. They have them now, and they cannot be taken away without compensation. So uh, you will have to use some combination of incentives and funding and cajoling and persuasion, and sometimes making compromises. And that's why we still call it a growth area, because we believe growth will occur even in those kinds of locations, but you can put it, we can put some pretty strict controls on it. It might be, for example, a good idea uh, to get away from that old habit where 
if a parcel of land had a given amount of property rights under county regulation, once it's annexed into the city, the old bad habit would be say, to say it automatically gets 25 times the density that it had before. Do you see what I mean? So there are ways to think about that. So let's look at the priority conservation areas first. I'm gonna ask Eric Pate to come up uh, and we'll uh, talk about that. First, I've talked about the green conscience on this effort, uh, Dr. J. Exum. Um, I joked at the symposium because he wore a suit and tie and stood up there. I'd never seen him in a suit and tie. He's always in a wide brimmed hat and overalls and wading boots. In my experience, he's a perfect guide to the ridge. And here is what he said. Um, observation of Tiger Creek and the adjacent floodplain. So we started talking today on the hike. What could we do upstream in a larger scale context to protect not only the creek, but the source of water, which in the case of Tiger Creek is both from the surface and the groundwater. So the, the protection like Bach Tower has done of the sand hills and the top of the ridge in other tracks like the pr preservation area at Mountain Lake Cutoff is uh, at the top of the ridge, but protecting the lowlands in Tiger Creek uh, associated with Tiger Creek are also important. And it requires us to think at a bigger scale so that the water supplies that feed Tiger Creek and the floodplain are protected. So in this envisioning process, we might think about ways to uh, make sure the water quantity is protected and we don't draw from that shallow aquifer that is feeding Tiger Creek Nature Preserve, but we might also seek ways to sustain and protect the water quality, things like septic tank effluent and fertilizers, we know increase nutrients in the creek and we might be able to protect that with either uh, acquisition, conservation easements, or certainly um, some sort of relationship with partners who, are, who uh, reside or own property in the, in the spring shed to protect that water quality, even though it's beyond the, the bounds of this 5,000 acre nature preserve. So it's important to look beyond this 5,000 acres and think about what we can do from a long-term standpoint to protect the water quality and quantity of, of Tiger Creek itself. All right, that's uh, the word, wise words of Dr. Exum. So Eric Pate from Dover Cole has been working alongside Elise Dallas and Dr. Exum on that Big Green Network. So he's gonna give you a summary and show you some maps. Thank you very much, Victor. Hi, everyone. As Victor said, my name is Eric Pate. Um, it really was a privilege to be able to work alongside Dr. Exum and, and Elise this week. Um, we were able to, to really take a, a broad scale uh, look at the study area here. And Jay, um, unfortunately, is not able to be here with us this evening, but he was able to, to give us a script to go through his slides because this it really is in a, such an important topic. There's very specific methods behind the uh, there's a very spe specific methodology behind this, so I don't want to stray too far from that. So with the, this whole idea of, of looking at the, the, the big green network, this protection of a big green network, it really is um, one of the primary aspirations of, of this effort of Lake Wales Envisioned. At the landscape level, our, our desire was to protect large swaths of, of natural lands connected to regional wildlife corridors. So, on the, the east side of the utility service area, we sought to, to connect the historic scrub and sandhill habitats with the Kissimmee River corridor. Um, and this is using data from statewide GIS databases um, from the Florida Natural Areas Inventory, among others. Um, we mapped um, the Florida Wildlife Corridor as well um, on, on these maps here, shown through the Florida Ecological Greenway Network Priority Ranking System that we see. On top of that, we looked at, at rare species habitat uh, and biological uh, diversity. And so this, this shows how when these, these layers combined on top of each other, they, they really illustrate this, this idea of a, of a larger corridor along the eastern side of the utility service area that 
um, is, is what we're calling the, the, the Ridge to River Corridor. Um, and this is an effort to connect the, the larger um, conservation areas to the north and south um, of the community uh, to, the, um, to the east there. Um, these maps are fascinating. We do have these maps. So on the, the west side of the uh, utility service area, we sought to protect water sources um, in the headwaters of the Peace River. Uh, using, again, various statewide GIS databases, we mapped the floor, again, the Florida Ecological Greenway Network and various landscape linkages along with uh, biological diversity in these areas. And this combined, again, shows us the larger concept of the Peace River Headwaters Corridor, um, which would protect wetlands, the 100-year floodplain, and vast areas of pine flatwoods and active agricultural land uh, along Peace Creek, um, which then leads to the Peace River and then on to Charlotte Harbor. So along the, the Peace Creek drainage system in the, in the northwestern portion of the utility service area, we also took a look at the, the floodplains here and other water resources um, throughout the canal system. Um, and again, using additional, the same overlays from various GIS databases, we were able to identify um, the, this larger connected creek and, and canal system um, to then add it to the, the big green network we've identified, as you can see here. Um, and so this, this is what we're calling the Peace Creek linkage. Um, and this, is, uh, this will protect, again, wetlands, floodplains, and serve as a component of, the, of Winter Haven's sapphire necklace. Um, this is the, the envisioned jewel of the, of the um, one water plan uh, from Winter Haven here. Um, so altogether, these represent the, the big green network that has been identified this week. Um, and so these, again, the various databases leading to this compilation showing how these, these two corridors on either side of the ridge here connect the larger statewide conservation strategies and bring it all together, looking at the bigger picture, the statewide picture, and bring it down to the local level here and seeing how Lake Wells plugs into larger statewide efforts. So that is the large scale. Another key component of this effort is looking at, at local scale, um, at, at, at how the community and, and at, at an even smaller, at the neighborhood scale, um, how that can incorporate this big green network. Um, and so presenting ideas um, such as bringing um, sand hill and scrub restoration on, on smaller parcels between the, the larger corridors, bringing in street trees, lush trails and greenways and parks um, used for stormwater treatment, in addition to you know, our backyards, looking at, at uh, plant, um, planting lists and, and identifying opportunities for the community to support this larger effort that allows the two larger corridors on the side to be connected through the community. So all these combined, this is, this is the big green network that is part of Lake Wells Envisioned. So with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Victor. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. All right, so we talked about the priority conservation areas. There's a lot there to absorb. Remember everything Eric just showed is a big, big what if, just an idea put forward for your consideration. But we'll get those maps on the website and uh, give you a chance to zoom in on them more closely and think about it and update them as we go. Next, let's look at the priority infill areas. Now, remember that dot exercise, the sticker dots that Amy described? Um, a few of this is one of the table group's uh, result. And actually, I like that she zoomed the camera way in because you can see how thick they piled the dots one on top of another. Uh, kind of. Embodying what Brandon Alvarado was, uh, was getting at in his testimonial earlier, that there were places where it was better to build more densely and well instead of spreading out. And those areas include the existing community between and downtown between 27 and 17, as well as areas along uh, Highway 60. So uh, remember for planners, maps are kind of like what x-rays are for doctors. So forgive our obsession with maps. And the first thing we did was realizing that not everything that is in the city limits has been developed in an, any intense way at present. 
uh, although presumably if it's been annexed, it's intended for some kind of urban purposes. We uh, made a map of where existing development of substance already exists. And to that we added next a map of uh, areas where there has already been development approved for, uh, for a site or uh, various proposed projects have been submitted for some kind of approval, one or the other. Can you toggle that back for one existing future? So a lot of the areas that you all identified in, as your priorities for growth and infill were actually areas where development is taking place. So that was a little bit reassuring. Next. So to, we put kind of a simplified diagram on here just to isolate those areas for uh, priority infill and new growth alongside the big green network that um, ridge to river uh, corridor or the Peace River linkage, a Peace Creek linkage that Eric described. We put them on the same map here. So you kind of begin to see that the uh, big green network is a, a shaper in a way of where development takes place. I think this is also, let's go to the next one. This is also in keeping with Edward Bach's uh, ideas because for those who don't know it, uh, in addition to doing things like funding the Olmsted brothers uh, 100 years ago to do anonymously, to do planning work for the city of Lake Wales. Uh, he was also fascinated with Tiger Creek and uh, among the group that at one time strongly recommended the Tiger Creek Preserve be a national park. So uh, we're trying to pick back up on those uh, cues and for many of you who've been banging the drum or keeping the flame uh, for environmental conservation, uh, you should recognize that in those maps. Well, if downtown is the most important, it's at the top of the pyramid, you hear me, Lake Wales Main Street, the number one thing is downtown. Uh, but in addition to that, where else can you imagine a bright center, like a concentration of deliberate development there to create a there, there? Well, one of them is at the uh, Orange Grove Shopping Center. So this is the intersection of 11th and 60. And you're looking kind of south, in this drone view, you're looking kind of uh, south, southeast. So some of you will recognize this as the site uh, where there's a whole lot of parking and you probably wondered what could that area, the land area, be used for. The truth is there's potential for housing in this area and mixed use development and transformation over time from a kind of a commercial only building spoken out of parking lots development form to a new village, a new bright center a neighborhood that happens to have commerce in it. And so this just illustrates the idea of soaking up some of peeling back some of the existing asphalt and reconfiguring it as the blocks and streets of a small neighborhood. Let's go to the next one. And this will kind of show change over time. Um, in, to, in the future, one story sites or uh, sites where the building is boarding up and not being used at present could be Reharvested, recycled in a way into new development sites. Uh, as you know, after some amount of demolition and new construction, what comes back is always bigger than what it replaced. And then in the process, though, you could create a whole new building to street relationship along Highway 60 and start to add the green tree lined streets that are clearly missing there today. Let's go to the next one. And this one takes another step and says, uh, in the future, there will come a time when the southernmost part of this is probably looked at as being a more valuable site for denser housing uh, than it is as an underperforming shopping center. So here's a what if where that step starts to take place. And in the process you get of peeling back that asphalt to make a development site, you also get a public space, which we'll show you from another angle in a minute. Next. Uh, and, and now we're going into really speculative territory. There, as you know, some of the buildings along Highway 60 or along Highway 27 are in the fourth phase of a five cycle obsolescence. So as those begin to be replaced, uh, we can look ahead toward what they would be replaced with. And uh, so this is just continuing that process. And then one more. We recognize that sites like the Orange Grove Shopping Center don't exist alone on an asteroid somewhere. They are connected to their surroundings, including 
opportunity sites that are adjacent. Next. So here, let's look at it from, an, from the angle where we're now moved just west of the property and we're looking east. So the 11th Street is in the foreground and here's that spot where a new neighborhood square could be created. Remember the, um, the idea that you just develop the gray parts and not the green parts isn't the Lake Wales way. The Lake Wales way is that you, gen you create generous public spaces and green as you go with seeking economic development. Now, you might wonder, where's the parking go if you're building on some of it? Exactly. You, the, the uh, parking areas will still need to be there. They'll still need to be efficient and sufficient, but you don't have an excess of it in, in the future like you do now. Next. You just step through those, that sequence in the same way change over time. So the nice thing about a hundred year plan is we don't have to know whether next year is the year that that property will be ready for such a transformation. We just have to understand that it probably will be eventually and get that set up. And the sooner that is set up and made easy under your land development regulations, the sooner the transformation is possible. Next. So I guess what this is really showing, you step through the sequence here, what this is showing is that you have a lot of lost space within the town you've already started. It can accommodate a lot of that population growth. Um, we'll, it probably won't, uh, on a site like that one, take the form of large single family houses on big lots. It's more likely to take the form of urban housing, you know, at attached houses like the ones in Savannah, uh, for example. Next. Um, you can see the room we're in right there, the Cathedral of the Arts, um, and the parking lots around it, and then behind it, Advent Hospital. Um, the hospital that is um, said to have uh, successfully achieved a turnaround and, and entered a new growth and improvement phase. So chances are, with an aging population and a growing population, your hospital is going to grow too. They always do. And so... It's worth anticipating that this doesn't have to be just a hospital poking out of a parking lot. It could be the centerpiece of a whole health district, a neighborhood that, where health and wellness is the primary focus. So I would expect that in the future, Tommy, your building will be part of a neighborhood rather than just sitting you know, kind of alone in the parking lots on the side of the hill. And there's every reason to think that could actually make the place feel better, be more welcoming um, to visitors and residents alike. Next. Those are examples of priority infill areas, and we will look to create more examples of like that in other locations as we go. Now, what about priority growth areas? Uh, remember that admonition from Edward Bach? Next. And remember that when in the early days, architectural quality and sense of place was not an optional add-on. It was something that was intrinsic to what they did. Now, of course, you know that about a fancy building like the Grand Hotel, which we hope we'll see uh, its uh, renaissance soon. But go to the next one. That same spirit is embodied in the simplest, most modest and humble structures. Because even on the smallest you know, railroad era home, the front porch was essential equipment. It was like mission critical equipment to creating neighborhood. Not with fancy moldings and ornament and so on in this case, because it's modest, but, but still setting up that sociable building to street relationship and family to neighborhood relationship. Next. Uh, and of course, designing the green as we go, starting with the green parts, uh, is also the Lake Wales Way. Next. So what we're looking for is what is the Lake Wales Way? Well, Lake Wales Way is to think about the parks and open spaces as you think about the buildings and the the dwelling units and the built, the built form. Next. We have to be especially sensitive to this right now. For those who haven't seen me show this chart in the, before, this is from the New York Times. It uh, was shown, it was published just last uh, fall, in the late fall. If you compare 2012 to 2019, you see something interesting. Uh, 11 years ago, our metropolitan statistical area here, the Lakeland, Winter Haven, Lake Wales metropolitan statistical area, actually had a surplus of houses relative to demand. So we're coming out of the Great Recession. 
Uh, you could find a similar statistic in Las Vegas and uh, Phoenix, for example. But uh, there were 3% more houses available at that time compared to the demand of the market. But by 2019, pre-COVID now, you were already at the point where that surplus had given way to deficit or to shortage. Uh, well, do you all remember economics 101, the, when the law of supply and demand? When something is scarce, scarcity drives prices up. And when something is in surplus, drives prices down. And the reason uh, it has become so expensive to find a place to own and rent in this region in recent years is because of that. So that is a pressure for needing to grow your way out of your problems. And it will only become more acute. Why? Because we're on the ridge and people fleeing the coasts are gonna come here. And with 1,300 people a day moving to Florida and 300 or more of them wanting to be in your region at that time, uh, they, are he they are here, they are coming, and they're gonna continue this uh, deficit. Let's go to the next one. Now, let's put that fact together with the decline of citrus. Next. Um, I know you all probably realize that long before citrus greening was identified, uh, citrus was already in decline as an industry, both here and in California. That's partly to do with international trade laws and what they're doing south of the border. Uh, it's partly having to do with uh, what people drink for breakfast, uh, changing over time. But at any rate, uh, in Florida, that number has gone into steep decline. And one more. Um, after the HLB infection, that's the citrus greening bacterial infection, it has fallen off a cliff. And a tiny fraction of the number of boxes of fresh fruit are picked now in this region and in Florida as, as a whole compared to 20 years ago. So we have to confront the fact that the families in your midst who have owned land for a hundred years or more, um, or close to it in other cases, who have been pillars and anchors of your community, been at the center of everything, all the glue holding your community together, are faced with a terrible dilemma. They are, every last one of them that we spoke to are trying hard to stay in the citrus business. They are hoping that the latest experiments with direct injection of the oxytetracycline, for example, well, that will finally be, after several other things have failed, that will finally be a thing that helps bring citrus back. And in the meantime, they're under a lot of pressure to use some of their vast land holdings to generate income so they can hold out on the rest. One of the uh, leaders in the citrus industry and one of your, uh, the head of one of your leading families said to me that he does not want to see the silhouette of an orange on the state license plate replaced with the silhouette of a ranch house with a garage snout sticking out the front of it. And I believe him. So while they're trying to stay in, in the citrus business, they are going to have to sell some land. And then you put that together with the big pressure that I described, it's inevitable there will be some new neighborhoods. Well, so the Lake Wales Way is needed and needed now because you're gonna have, if you're gonna be faced with an inevitability of some growth on previously greenfield sites, you're gonna need to make sure they turn into neighborhoods that are worthy of Lake Wales. Next. So what is the Lake Wales Way? Is it this? That was a rhetorical question, but I am curious. Is it this? <laughs> okay, I didn't think so. Uh, but what you're looking at in this picture, which was taken from an aerial photograph not too terribly far away in a nearby community, uh, is the default setting for the subdivision building industry. The, that's various names, blow and go, ram it and jam it, uh, the intestinal layout, one of, one of those was called. <laughs> so they are building houses and there's a demand for houses and they are building subdivisions, but they're not building neighborhoods. So what would a neighborhood look like? Well, um, the Lake Wales Way with the front porch on even the most modest house is not like this. It's, you've experimented with this in the past on some of your through going roads. Backing up the houses to the through going roads so that was everybody's 
impression of your community, whether they're visitors or residents, is like this, is not yet at that standard we could call the Lake Wales Way. Next. Um, and it's very hard once the land pattern sets in place in this way to ever fix it. When we could add more landscaping, we could decorate the, the street, we could try to make the street smaller to have room to add the street trees which weren't contemplated. But we're never gonna overcome the fundamental problem of what I called earlier the building to street relationship. Next. Um, now, there are developers who are building these conventional subdivisions who bother to put in sidewalks and street trees, for example. Someday these trees will grow rather substantial. But the building to street relationship is still the garage door as the central feature. So this is what they normally do. And they're gonna tell you that they know there's a market for this. Next. So that brings us to these aspirations that are on the poster I described before. Um, there are eight of them. The city commission adopted these as kind of guide rails or, or guardrails or guideposts for us in uh, working on it. Next. One of them, number six, <laughs> says, I like that it has a number, like the, the Sixth Amendment. <laughs> number six, we will seek to make traditional neighborhoods with walkable connected streets and a high quality public realm the norm. The norm, not the exception to the rule, right? But the norm. Well, that's a big difference from what uh, industry is used to producing now. Next. And there are some small details that help a lot with achieving it. Uh, for example, an alley or a rear lane. Uh, here's one of the more charming ones uh, in the historic district. Um, that's between 3rd and 4th and north of Sesum. Just go to the next one. You know, putting the, the, the parking in the garage and the garbage cans and the service side of the house on the alley meant it's possible to go to the next one to do that on the street side. And so the building a street relationship is always helped when we can put the front in the front, like the front porch or the storefront uh, or the balcony or the stoop, if we can put the front in the front. And so getting that re-infused into Lake Wales development culture could be part of what I'm calling the Lake Wales way. Next. Uh, what else is part of it? Well, special sites for civic buildings. Um, you know, the, whether it's the churches in the historic area um, or, uh, or the, the old school or the, the tourist club at Crystal Lake Park, there was a Lake Wales way to incorporate civic buildings right in and among homes. So instead of a subdivision that has just 150 or 400 identical houses in it and one way in and one way out, you could have a neighborhood that has civic buildings in it, whether it's the daycare or the post office or a, a church, place of worship. And the building and street relationship, we don't have to wander very far to see a kind of encyclopedia of the many varied ways of doing it. They're just a few blocks apart around Crystal Lake and Lake Wales. Thanks. Um, so uh, Mari Chayo, my, my wife, uh, who's an architect, started drawing this stuff. And I think, you know, Mari's a provocateur. She starts drawing and saying, to provoke us and to provoke you and, and say, is this what you meant? And in that poster that she painted, there's something pretty important I want you to see. Zoom in. On the, here's just taking that hypothetical elevation of a series of houses, which is not unlike what happens when the houses, uh, one after the other, surround Lake Wales along the lake shore or on Park Avenue, let's say. Can you zoom in? If we zoom in on the left, in this picture, what we're actually seeing is a group of row houses from the side. So this first building is actually several buildings, one behind the other, that are attached. And then behind it, it has a garden, and the garage is in an outbuilding. The one beyond it maybe has an accessory dwelling unit, or a mother-in-law quarters, or granny flat, or what are the other names? Fonzie unit, remember Fonzie lived above the garage? So, and then that's along the alley. And then to its right is a bungalow. And so, the, on the left here, we see a small cottage 
just like the arts and crafts or craftsman bungalows around Lake Wales. And next to it is a bigger, grander edifice that if you look closely is actually a duplex. Two houses that have been attached to one another. Next to that, a, a sort of standard uh, a house. And then next to that, potentially a live work unit where someone has an expanded home-based business. Next. And if we move our, our, along from left to right, what you're seeing is a kind of range or a variety within the same neighborhood. Uh, so over here on the, in the middle in the white could be an estate residence that has got a bigger lot and a bigger house and is you know, catering to executives. And then the one just beyond it is about the same size, but has four dwelling units in it. The economists call that a mansion apartment house. It's designed and looks like a mansion. It's designed to sit on the same block with fine single family houses, but it has four or six or eight uh, dwelling units. Next. So how, can, how do you do this? What is the design method? It starts with the city block. Let's just take a piece of land here on our Greenfield site. This is say 225 feet by four or 500 feet this area, and next. The first thing you have to do is see it in a pattern with its surrounding blocks. Um, and so that means the streets themselves are in a kind of web or a network or a grid. And of course the Lake Wales way is probably to relax and crank the streets according to topography and natural features, like the Olmsted Brothers firm did in Druid Hills or the founders did around Crystal Lake. Now, Next, streets. Now, not just any streets, but streets that have room for street trees and sidewalks, a continuous network, so now green streets. Next, we have our block, so let's figure out where the front and the back goes. Okay, here's a little lane or uh, alley in the center of the block. So now when we subdivide the remaining land, we know where the front of the lot is facing the streets, we know where the back of the lot is, along the alley, and we think through how those things interconnect. Good fences make, make good neighbors, so we had fences, garden walls, hedges uh, that start to define one's uh, sphere, and now we're ready for houses. Uh, so here are the houses, some of them are set closer to the street, probably the ones that are down the slope, some are set a little farther from the street, probably the ones on the high side of the street. And they have that building to street relationship. Front porches within conversation distance of the sidewalk because that's the Lake Wales way. And then along the alley, we get the outbuildings for garages or garage apartments. Keep going. Up at the top of the picture, let's surround the square with some attached houses. Those are single family attached houses or they could be townhouses for rent. And they can vary. You could have big ones on the corner that are three stories tall and smaller ones in the mid block that are two stories tall and sell for a lesser price. But over here along the park or the pond overlooking the drive, we could have bigger houses and the mansion apartments. This is how you build a neighborhood the, the, the traditional American way. Um, and it's exactly the way that the Lake Wales Historic District was assembled this kind of network of blocks and streets, lots on the blocks, and lots having fronts and backs, and then variety in the housing uh, thus assembled. No. And color. <laughs> so you can see the park on the, or on the lower right, you can see the square and the neighborhood square in the upper uh, center. And then from one side of our sample block to the other, we go from row houses to cottage court to, and bungalow to standard house, to live work, to executive house, to uh, apartment mansion, apartment house, to house for the lottery winner. That was the one we built last, so you can charge the most for it. Next. Um, and then I, I couldn't resist, I mean, the Lake Wales way is to integrate special sites for civic purposes as well. So. If you had that green and you're in a brand new neighborhood and all those houses with front porches and those beautiful street trees, wouldn't you want your wedding to happen there? So, so there, we had the civic building. So just to recap that, the ingredients are not complicated. Streets, next. Alleys, it's not that you, everything has to have an alley, but the more 
the better, especially when the lots get narrow, then public spaces like parks and squares and special sites for civic buildings that are like the anchors. Now, based on what I just showed you as a kind of first draft recap of what I've been calling the Lake Wales Way to Do Neighborhoods, go back and look at the historic district and see if you think you, it, it has something in common with it. This might actually be a little denser than the old part of town when they thought the whole state was made of open space, wide open canvas. That's what you told us when you started putting orange stickers closer together. There's, by the way, if you're on Park Avenue and you're looking at what I just described, take a look at the Court of the Seven Chimneys. It's a courtyard apartment building right on, the, on a lot that's roughly the same as any house lot, but has multiple units in it. And so we added to our little illustration of the Lake Wales Way, a courtyard apartment building. Next, there's the attached houses or townhouses, traditionally called row houses, houses in a row. And then sites for the mansion apartment buildings, the larger houses that, and the houses for the rest of us. <laughs> and maybe because some of us need smaller quarters or we're moving down or empty nesters, some of those cottages, um, there you go. So, is there a market for this? this is, if, if we are gonna turn that industrial air, aircraft carrier so that it starts building the Lake Wales way again, we've gotta know that that's feasible, right? Uh, and that people who build things for a living can do it and make money doing it. And that it won't be some sort of un, undue hardship on anyone, the you, the taxpayers, the future, home buyers or what have you. So we took that question to Todd Zimmerman, uh, who's the leading analyst for uh, the real estate realities of this kind of work. And he gave us a recap this morning. Uh, he has still a lot of work to do over the next couple of weeks to get a detailed report. But when we have it, we're gonna share it with all the developers, landowners, city staff, all of you. Uh, we know enough from Todd's, uh, the early stages of his work to say, yes, there is a market for traditional neighborhoods. Even though someone isn't doing it right now, well, except for the people who are buying and selling the older houses and fixing them up. Um, but even though the, de the developers uh, act in a activity around the area have not been building these traditional neighborhoods, Todd said unequivocally this morning, uh, there is indeed a market. And I'll just show you one of the reasons. In the previous 30 year period from 1980 to 2010, most of the people who were, who were changing houses or creating households were people in the 35 to 64 age range. That in that period is the baby boomers. And, uh, and a few of, of, of those uh, households in, in the midst of change were their parents, older households. But look at the current era. The second set of bars on the right is 2010 to 2040. So we're right in the middle of that. And what we're seeing is that young people are still uh, buying and selling houses and creating households and changing homes. But most of the action is for older folks from 64 and up. And this is a, a national idea that is even more extreme in Florida. Now, all this tells you is that there's going to be a reduced demand in the coming era for large single family detached houses and a greatly increased demand for smaller houses, houses uh, which uh, do not require the maintenance of a, of a large garden or, or yard and not uh, of such size that people are spending every, all the money they've saved their whole lives trying to heat it and air condition it and store stuff in it. That's essentially what the empty nester period you are in means that for the foreseeable future, a lot of the action is gonna be on those attached houses and those smaller cottages, bungalows, and what have you. Next. All right, we are almost at the end of this and then we're gonna to switch to transportation questions because everybody's gotta be wondering, Victor, if you build all those buildings, is it, are we gonna choke on the traffic? So I'm gonna ask you, Wade, to get ready to come up and maybe Eric, you can pass the mic to, to Wade. So what about out, out beyond those areas where we're building new neighborhoods and we're moving into controlled limited growth? Next. 
Um, the main idea is that there will be some development out there, but it, if you try to do a little bit of development everywhere, that's going to consume all the land. So no more green network. However, if you deliberately bring things closer together, then you can have both limited development and large scale conservation, green and long views across open space. Go to the next one. So Eric created a beautiful little diagrammatic series here that illustrates the difference between the two. If we take this area of a former grove um, and then imagine once the grove has been, they push up the grove and now it's going to become something. Uh, if they just develop according to the low density uh, provided by existing uh, county property rights and they do it one piece at a time as it's often done, what you will end up with is very large lots, not that many of them, and almost all of the land consumed. Because what isn't eaten up by the large lots that meet that required minimum lot size is going to get eaten up by the stormwater ponds and what have you. But, next, if on the other hand we take the former grove and we go through that same sequence and imagine building, well, <clears throat> more like the Lake Wales Way, a village in the countryside, uh, it's conceivable that you could actually have vast amounts of preservation and significant development. And here's the punchline, significant development that will be far more valuable and affordable to deliver, both for the builders and for municipal services over the coming millennium. So one of those places where we were, we were constantly reminded that the um, the green backdrop is changing is along Scenic Highway. So I want to register with you, um, and uh, Sean, you can tell Ryan that I flagged this for everyone because he flagged it for me. Scenic Highway is central to your brand. Highway 17 is where the story of the ridge is told. And uh, once the scenery of the Scenic Highway is lost, you will never recover or restore that. So uh, I wonder, Wade, if you could talk about how we do things like protect a scenic highway and have development and complete streets. Yeah, absolutely. This is Wade Walker. Absolutely, Victor. And one of the things about scenic highway is it is very scenic. And some of the great views, the view that was uh, shown previously, you get those in a lot of places on it, but you also get things like this. And this is actually just north of, um, this is just north of Burns. And, you know, some of the things that you can do in here are very much in line with the, uh, the original vision for the Ridge Scenic, Hi Ridge Scenic Highway and the corridor management plan and the goals and aspirations that are listed in that document. And being able to do things like provide facilities for active transportation, for walking and biking uh, in these corridors. Bring some of that scenery, bring some of that green that we're talking about out onto the street, protecting those views, those long views and those view sheds, but also making the street itself more beautiful and more scenic. And all of those things, you know, we can do all of those things within the context of the work that's already been done and within the corridor management plan uh, that we have. And you know, there's some unique opportunities coming up um, with some resurfacings uh, coming up very soon. Um, and what we need to do is let's make sure that we know what we wanna do and what we want on these corridors uh, so that that can start to inform that process as well. L lots of hand wringing over many, many years over traffic, uh, like Victor said. and. Um, you know, this is not this is not something that happened from since the 1950s. This image, this cartoon, appeared in the LA Times a hundred years ago. So you know, we were really worried about traffic in the era between we were switching from the Model T to the Model A, and we were really, uh, we you know, we really were worried about traffic congestion. And you know, if we really think historically about streets, streets are really for people. Um, you know, going all the way back to uh, the, the Roman thoroughfares uh, of old and really creating these public spaces for people to get around. 
one of the things that we heard loud and clear this week was, you know, I, I, I know that I need to go places by car, but gosh, I wish there were some times that I just didn't have to. And part of what, what Victor and, and everybody's been talking about is looking at, you know, one thing of the Lake Wales Way may be, do I have to, be, do I have to use my car for every single trip that I make? Or can we have facilities so that if we have a week that, uh, you know, I think we were blessed with a, a great charrette week, after, the, uh, after moving the studio in the rain on, uh, in the torrential rain on Monday morning, we were blessed with some very, very nice uh, weather and be able to take advantage of that um, and be able to be outside. And, you know, I'd like, really like to walk to the store. I'd like to ride my bike to the store. I'd like to really get on my, uh, my zippy new little electric e-bike and get, get to where I wanted to go. So those are some of the things that, that we, we looked at. And we asked, we asked people on Saturday, you know, what do you want your streets to look like? Um, and, and we see Robert here presenting uh, what, you know, what, 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 what we wanted our streets to look like. And we used a couple of examples. And one of them was this uh, 75 foot right of way like Burns Avenue. It really wasn't a mistake. That was, uh, we really wanted to see what, what people thought about it. Um, and, and you saw the image earlier that said raceway. And, and we heard that a lot uh, about Burns. Why is it so wide? Why, why, is it, why is it not green? Why is it just not a really pretty street? And it's funny that it's ironic that it's the front door to one of the most treasured places in Lake Wales. And so how do we start to bring that out onto the street and really create that front door uh, for the community? So I want you just to imagine for a second. Uh, one thing I can tell you about Burns, from a traffic standpoint, we don't need all those lanes. We really don't. From a car traffic standpoint. What we want to do, we want this street to move people. And we want it to move people effectively and give them a choice of how they move. And it's okay for streets to be beautiful. We really want to make sure that, that the streets are beautiful. So one of the things that, that we looked at was how do we start to bring that out? How can we, um, how can we re really rebalance Burns Avenue? So this is just one idea of uh, how you can do that. This is actually adding uh, what we call protected bike lanes. So that while they're on the street, they're separated. Uh, so you've got about a six foot, air, six foot landscape area, can have slotted curves, can be rain gardens, keeping with the green aspect, uh, being able to flow water through there. Your bikes are separated from the cars by this barrier and we have places to do plantings uh, as well. So we can really create that street that really is that character. And we can do these kinds of things with, uh, with a lot of the streets, uh, both new and, uh, both old and new within, uh, within Lake Wales. So next. And, it's, and we really don't have to be limited to this kind of accommodation on those streets. Let's, let's take the big hairy beast that, uh, that we all know as US 27. And you know, what are some things that we can do there? We can have pedestrian accommodation on, uh, on 27. We can have green uh, on that roadway as well. We can have facilities so that people can easily get from one side of the street to the other in a protected manner. And we really need to, uh, and, and so we can, we can start to look at those things and really create a street that doesn't look like things that are north and south of here. And as you come through Lake Wales, there's nothing to discern that you're actually entering the community. And we can, and the interesting thing is measures like this can actually start to slow traffic and uh, create what, what we call speed management by starting to enclose that roadway. Why would you want to do that? Just be clear. Why would you want to slow traffic? Well, if we start to put people on the street, um, what, we call, what we call vulnerable users, like, like I am right now, not surrounded by two tons of, two or sometimes even four tons of steel. Um, and as, as, as you showed earlier, Victor, being able to change the character of the land uses along some of these roadways, it might actually promote people wanting to walk along there. You know, right now, I don't think I would, you know, we may not want, we may not think about walking along uh, State Road 60, 
But could we, would we walk along something if we started to re-envision the, uh, the Orange Blossom Shopping Center? Is that an area that we might want to walk along or cross the street to come over to this facility or things around the medical district? So we really wanna be able to, to look at ways to do that. And we want, to, uh, we want to calm traffic as it comes through the community. I, I always say that it's like, uh, you know, traffic should behave as if they're in your living room if they're in your town. You know, we don't want the, the herd of elephants running through the living room willy-nilly. We want them to behave. We want our visitors to our town uh, as they're passing through to behave. And so, again, that can be part of the Lake Wales Way as well. Next. So, like I said, it's not just the streets that we have today. It's the streets that, that have been shown on some of these other plans. And what would those actually look like? Uh, you've done a lot of work through, through your mobility plan, and there's a lot of other plans that have been done and a lot of work, and they all talk about this idea of complete streets. And there's lines on a map that say, well, this is gonna be a complete street, and this is gonna be a complete street, and this is gonna be a complete street. So one of the things that, that we hope to do through this process is really start to put some flesh on those bones as to what those streets actually look like. What, what is a complete street in Lake Wales? And it can be anything from, uh, you know, these more rural two-lane roads that are starting to transition as these village connectors, so starting to connect some of these neighborhoods that, that we've been looking at. Um, and what does that mean? We want accommodation for pedestrians and bicyclists. And one of the things we clearly heard on uh, Saturday was, and, and throughout the week, is we don't want, I don't want to walk or bike right on the road. Bike lanes just, you know, they're not that comfortable. I want to be separated from the road. So, you know, that's one of the things. So think about Chalet Suzanne Road. Think about Masterpiece Road. Think about some of those other roads. Simply adding a shared use path along one side can start to convey people or give them the ability to connect between some of those neighborhoods. As those facilities start to come into these uh, more built up areas or these village areas, maybe on some of those streets where you have some of that, uh, the, those townhouses or the, the uh, apartments, uh, or manor, manor apartments, uh, we'd want to have parking. And so you can actually accommodate that with the on-street parking. You can use uh, areas to create planting areas, and then also have the, uh, the sidewalks uh, on the street as well. Um, in areas where you may have a village center, maybe instead of the green area between the parking and the sidewalk, maybe it's all hardscape. So then it gives you the ability to do things like outdoor dining or being out on the sidewalk. And we also consider the trail network as part, as an integral part of that transportation system because it's going to convey people uh, from, from place to place in these destinations. And it's not only about recreation, but it's about being able to move around uh, and be mobile and make some of those trips uh, as well. Next. So the, this series of diagrams shows the, uh, you know, the, the street network that, that we have today. Next. And what came out of the mobility plan as far as uh, the, all the green are uh, you know, complete street retrofits. There's also some new connections in here uh, as well. Next. And then, as also as part of a lot of those plans, we looked at a lot of different plans that have been done as far as what what's on the books as far as the multimodal network. So a few things to really start to think about is this idea of the, you know, the Ridge Scenic Highway Trail, uh, you know, looked at it along that uh, 17 corridor. Uh, there's Sun Trail, um, Sun Trail projects that are, are not currently funded, but are opportunity network. The idea of this Bartow to Lake Wales connection, the Bartow to Lake Wales Trail, and how does that fit into the network? And then, some of the things that were done through uh, Lake Wales Connected, as well as uh, the mobility plan uh, and uh, Florida DEP's uh, priority network, uh, priority and opportunity network as well. But then if we start to layer in that, uh, the, the big green network and the neighborhoods that we've been talking about this week, we start to look at, if we go to the next slide, we can start to look at, you know, what are these other opportunities and what do we do? And uh, this map isn't complete. Uh, the, the full map will be available in the back of the room at the, uh, at the conclusion of the presentation. But just a few highlights that we start to look at. If you start to play off of some of these, we can make, uh, you'll see on the big map, we can, we can look for connections to Tiger Creek. 
so everybody can experience what, uh, what, what we all got to experience on Sunday. Catfish Creek in the north part of the, uh, in the, north part of the community as well. Uh, and then maybe even take advantage of the Peace Creek watershed. So being able to connect through there, potentially new, to new development uh, in that area, and then be able to uh, tie into this more regional trail system, uh, Bartow to Lake Wales. And one really important thing is it all fits within not only the context of the green um, and the mobility, but it's an economic, it's another economic development driver. Um, who, who in here has been over to Dunedin or been to Winter Garden and the West Orange Trail or Pinellas Trail and seen what has, uh, you know, what the things that have happened there as well. And, and there's no reason that, uh, there's no reason that Lake Wales couldn't be part of a bigger picture along one of these, these larger trail systems and take advantage of that. Um, transit, we think, is also a big part of it. We looked at uh, one of the recommendations out of the mobility plan was this idea of a transit circulator. And as you start to bring it all together, next, um, you know, what can that be? Can that be something like a, an autonomous shuttle? Uh, can we build it around this mobility hub where all of it comes together with the electric bikes, scooters, uh, transit to connect downtown and Bach Tower Gardens? And can it? And, and we have the technology available that you can you can buy your ticket, see where the shuttle is, all of that right on the cell phone that you've been doing the keypad polling with. So, thank you. All right, thank you, Wade. Let's thank Wade Walker. So remember those three big themes I started with? Let's talk about what you have to do to pursue them that we know of already. Next. If the, with the job priorities, you've got to really focus on training and education, and that is also incubating small business, investing in tech. Number three, identifying new sites for industry so that manufacturing and health sciences that need more elbow room have sites. But the bottom two are all about the workers themselves. You need that variety of housing in order to attract the employees and in industry, including the remote workers. And if we put our focus on the quality of life for all the people here, including those em employees, then we will successfully promote Lake Wales for remote workers. Who wouldn't want to be able to take a pause at lunch and go out on the trail network that, that Wade described, for example? Next, the green stuff, well, the first one is about spending, uh, pursuing the funds, Lake Wales' share of those uh, new county conservation funds, for example, state funds and philanthropic funds, and you use that money to acquire land and or conservation easements. That's at the very top of the list. But there are some other things you can do. In the, in the rule book, for example, zoning, we can incentivize and require conservation. We can incentivize green building. You know, the Parks and Recreation Plan for Lake Wales, which is quite ambitious, anticipates population growth, but the canvas has grown this week, so we need to go update that and plan ahead for the Parks and Recreation Plan of 10, 20, and 50 years from now. On the neighborhood stuff, well, like I said, the most explosive and the biggest change, but making traditional neighborhood development the norm should be making it easy to get an approval for it. Uh, that means making it by right, changing the system so that that's the default setting instead of the sprawl subdivision. Ease approvals for what you do want. Don't bother easing approvals for what you don't want. Uh, so that happens in the zoning. Complete streets are related. You know, Every town has a public works manual. Every town has standard cross sections and so on that say this is what we're attempting to be. Smart towns anticipate that there will be, the state will pop up and the county will pop up from time to time with reworking the streets you already have. For example, a, a few of your key corridors are slated for resurfacings between now and 2026. So that means you should get out there with a plan for how you want to be put back after they scrape off what's there. So now is the time for that. And in the end, number five is Promote, 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 because if you want a better grade of neighborhood developer to come be active here, you've got to let them know that this is a place where they'd be welcome. Next. Let's see your reactions to some of what we reported. 
Amy, you want to walk us through the quick poll? We're going to give you a chance now to respond to the things you just saw. All right, so for those who are already logged in, uh, you won't need to do this again, but really quick, I'm gonna go over the instructions for anyone new joining us. So how you do this is with your phone, you send a text to 22333, and the message is Dover Cole, D-O-V-E-R-K-O-H-L 516. Uh, so when you do that, you'll get this confirmation code. And again, if you've already done this, you can just reopen the text message you had open earlier. And what you do is you text your answer right in there. Uh, so I'll give it just a minute for anyone who's still getting it out. And um, we're gonna first uh, go revisit some of the ideas that we've uh, talked through tonight. So first is this idea of a big green network. Um, and we wanna hear from you. Um, what do you think about these ideas? Uh, so A is you like it. B is not sure yet, need more information. And C is don't like it. The next idea, um, Victor spent some time uh, talking about this uh, potential health district near Highway 60, uh, you know, right outside the door from where we are today. Uh, so we're going to ask the same question again about the, the ideas for this area. If you can go to the next. Um, what do you think of the ideas for the health district on Highway 60? So A is like it, B not sure yet, uh, need more info, and C don't like it. We're always very curious and cross our fingers when these questions come up. So uh, it's great to it's great to get this live feedback from those in the room. And so we're about set. And for those who uh, don't like any of these, we're going to have some time uh, to talk with our team afterwards. So we're curious to hear from you. You know things that you think we should be updating. So we'll go to the the next slide. So Victor spent some time talking about new neighborhoods. What should new neighborhoods look like in Lake Wales? Um, and curious, um, you know, for all of the information that you know, was presented, the, the slides on building types and the you know, design of neighborhoods, you know, what did you think about those ideas? So A is like it, B not sure yet, C don't like it. Um, so the last question like this we're going to ask is about the complete streets ideas that Wade just talked about. So he talked about this, you know, palette of streets for new streets, also ideas for how to retrofit existing streets. Um, and so the, the same question, you know, do you think these ideas for complete streets are promising? So A is that you, you like this and we should continue to pursue this. Uh, B, not sure yet. C, don't like it. Uh, and again, if you're answering C, I want you to go talk to Wade after this meeting and let him know what your concerns are so we can make sure that as we advance further, we know uh, what we should be adjusting. All right, so this next one, you're going to actually be able to text your answers in. So um, of the many ideas we discussed tonight, which things are most exciting to you? So we're curious to hear um, you know, what things, uh, you know, stood out to you. And uh, we talked for quite a bit, so again, you know, really want to uh, hear, you know, which things stood out. Could be things about the neighborhoods or uh, green space. I see got in there, green areas, the big green network. <laughs> so Burns Avenue. Uh, the city is a destination for remote workers. It's interesting. Contradictory ideas. Okay, so you should come talk to us. <laughs> A uh, town with more trees and walkways. Neighborhood near Hillcrest Hospital and Arts Center. Lots of green network, that's great. Jay would be very happy to know. <laughs> Jobs. Okay. Oh, there's still a couple coming in. Where is affordable housing? Yes, we should, we should talk a bit about affordability and we will address that. Um, multi-generational living spaces. Okay, um, finalize your answers, and Lisa, do you wanna move on to the next question? Um, okay, well this one, 
<laughs> okay, so this one is a, another uh, combination on the theme. Are there any issues that you didn't hear about tonight that you'd like the planning team to investigate for the vision? So what about infrastructure and sustainability? That's uh, you know, good questions. You know, we're right at the beginning of this process, establishing the vision. So you know, our job next is to go back and um, you know, really flesh out the details. And we'll be coming when we come back for our next meetings. We'll have you know a lot more details and information. So uh, you know, please fill in things that you want us to be talking about and addressing um, in the next the next meetings. So affordable housing, I saw a couple times here, historic preservation. I'm watching Megan and Rusty's thumbs going like this. <laughs> Typing as fast as they can. This is fun, right? How does this get paid for? Of course, um, we'll have to address that, uh, talk about funding sources. We're gonna give this just uh, another 30 seconds. So where will you put the additional hospitals, schools, and police stations? Of course, you know, it's not thinking about where new uh, public services go. Robert and Susan, I saw you furiously typing. Did you get everything? Yeah. Any more? Okay. Yeah, right. and, and if you think of one after we adjourn, that's not too late. You can tell us. Okay, we're going to give 10 seconds. And Elise, go on to the next slide. Okay. Um, so based on what you heard tonight, um, we're asking, do you think that the vision is on the right track? So A is yes, B is probably yes, C is maybe, need more information, and D is no. Good, promising start, so thank you all. <laughs> um, all right, so um, the next slide. So what happens after today? So immediately after this, we've got some uh, exhibits in the back of the room. So some of those maps, like the trails map that were hard to see up on the screen, you can come back and study. We're also gonna have everything up on the website. And we'll put the, a video of this presentation as well as you, know, you can zoom in and look at everything and leave comments and questions there. Our team, as I mentioned, is going to be working on, you know, uh, you know, filling out more details and we expect to be back in the summer with more presentations and information. So that is our immediate next steps. Just a final thought. I want to make sure, you know, I joked with some that they should take a souvenir poster because this only happens once every hundred years. But with, when the Olmstead brothers were brought here to work on the town in 1925, we're right at a hundred years. We may not get another chance for another 100 years to do this, this ambitious and sweeping a planning process. So keep participating. That said, I, I, on behalf of our whole team, a deep heartfelt thank you for the welcoming us to come help you be part of that once in a century opportunity. We are seduced by your town and dearly, dearly committed ourselves to helping you make it everything you can make it. I'm sure you've heard the saying that, you know, we all grew up sitting under the shade of a tree that we did not plant or in a classroom in a school that we did not build because that's the way this works. We're looking off the, across the horizon and thinking about what the generations that come after us will need. And are they going to thank us for what's, what we build in our generation? Are they going to be a little mad at us for it? That is a challenge before you. Thank you very much.